we're here in Solenhofen, Germany to talk about geologic time. Now this might look like an ordinary quarry, but it's actually one of the most famous quarries in the world. The Solenhofen limestone is home to some of the most perfectly preserved marine and terrestrial organisms ever. In fact, these creatures have been so perfectly fossilized that we can see details like skin, scales, feathers, even the hair-like tentacles of these ancient jellyfish. In this lithograph, we can see a fish that got buried as it was snatching up its prey. In this case, a pterosaur, or an ancient flying reptile. This may look like a rock with some weird lumpy shapes on it, but it's actually one of Zollenhofen's most spectacular exhibits. These are actually preserved jellyfish. And if you think about it, these jellyfish have been preserved despite the fact that they have absolutely no hard parts whatsoever. It's also home to these guys. This is Archaeopteryx. It's one of the first known feathered dinosaurs, and it kind of represents the missing link between dinosaurs and modern birds. A lot of work has gone into figuring out how these guys flew and what their life was like when they lived back in the Jurassic. Other things in the Solenhofen limestone tell us what the environment was like at the time. These are preserved conifers, and they tell us that these island environments were very wet and marshy, just like a lot of coastal environments today. Solenhofen, which is now part of Central Europe, looked a lot different back in the Jurassic. If we go back through time, we can see that it was actually part of several different geologic environments, including an archipelago, which is where we find all the creatures that are preserved today. But how do we know what Solenhofen looked like back in the Jurassic? And how do we know what changes occurred to make it look like it does today? And the biggest question is how do we know when those changes happened? Well, we can discover all this by studying geologic time. Now we actually study geologic time in two ways. One of these is relative age dating. In relative age dating, we don't actually attach any ages or numbers to anything, but we put things into a relative sequence. What came first, what came second, what came third, and so on. In absolute age dating, we actually attach an age to the rocks that we find. And we can do this through uh, what we know about radioactivity. Now, if we're walking along a cliffside and we see a bunch of geologic features on this cliff, uh, we want to know what order these things came in. And to do that, we use relative age dating. But to figure out what sequence they came in, we have to follow five different principles. Now, the first of these is the principle of superposition. And the principle of superposition is pretty simple. It just says that the oldest stuff is on the bottom. Imagine you have a pile of laundry. Now, in the first, uh, first day of the week, you put your socks at the bottom of that pile of laundry. The second day of the week, you throw on your shorts, then your jeans, then your t-shirts, then your sweatshirts. At the end of that week, you have a giant stack of laundry. And at the very bottom, the thing that came first were your socks that you put in there at the beginning of the week. The same thing happens with rocks. The oldest rocks are on the bottom. Now, when we see the oldest rocks on the top, that means that that whole sequence, that whole package of rock has been overturned. And it's a very important geologic event. The second of these is the principle of original horizontality. Now this also applies to sedimentary rock. This says that all sedimentary rock was originally deposited horizontally. If you imagine your bathtub full of water and you take a bunch of sand and you dump that sand into the water, that sand is going to settle down in a very horizontal, very even layer. The same thing happens with other sedimentary rocks. So if we see sedimentary rocks that have been folded or tilted we know that something happened to deform those rocks, to change how those rocks appear. The third principle is called the uh, principle of inclusions. And this principle of inclusions applies to not only sedimentary rock, but also, uh, also igneous rock. Let's say you have a stream bed, and that stream bed is eroding everything and leaving behind a bunch of pebbles and stones. Well, the next layer to be deposited in that stream bed is going to contain those pebbles and stones of the older rock. So the principle of inclusions states that the oldest material is included in the younger material. This also applies to igneous rock. As it burns its way up through the crust, it'll start melting off and picking out bits and pieces of other rock. Well, those bits and pieces are of older rock. So those inclusions are from older rock. The fourth principle is the principle of cross-cutting relations. Cross-cutting relations states that the material that cuts across another material is the younger of the two. So this can happen in three different ways. You can have a fault that breaks the rock and cuts it. That rock had to be there first for it to be cut. The same thing goes with igneous intrusions. 
An igneous intrusion, as it burns its way up through the crust, will sometimes intrude itself into overlying rock layers. As it intrudes itself and wedges itself in on its way to the surface, it'll actually cut across older rock. So if you see an igneous body that's cutting across an older rock, that you know that igneous body is younger. The third of these are called unconformities. Unconformities are what happen when we have erosion. Now, erosion is kind of like an eraser. You spend a lot of time building up and building up and building up rock layers. Then erosion comes along, and erosion removes those rock layers. So we're missing time. Now, an unconformity is what happens when you have layers of rock, they're eroded, and then more layers are put on top of them. You can have three different types of unconformities, too. These are an, an angular unconformity, a disconformity, and a nonconformity. And you can remember them in various ways. An angular unconformity is layers of sedimentary rock that are overlying a bed that is at an angle to those. So you have horizontal layers, and then beneath those are angled layers. The next is a disconformity. Now this is a little bit, a uh, little bit subtle, because a disconformity is just sedimentary rock on top of more sedimentary rock. But there's a disconnect. Now what happens here is you lay down layer upon layer upon layer of sedimentary rock underneath the ocean. That ocean recedes, the uh, sea level goes down, and that material is exposed to the atmosphere. As it's exposed to the atmosphere, you erode it down and remove that material suddenly sea level rises again and as sea level rises you deposit more material on top of that so you have a sedimentary layer that's disconnected from other sedimentary layers by millions of years and the third type of unconformity is what we call a non-conformity and this is pretty simple you have an igneous body that comes up to the surface it's eroded down and planed off and then on top of that you deposit more sedimentary rock so you have not you have sedimentary rock on top of non-sedimentary rock that's what we call a nonconformity. So, faults, igneous intrusions, and unconformities are three different types of intrusions. The fifth principle that we follow is what's called the principle of faunal succession. And this just states that certain fossil assemblages occurred in a certain order throughout geologic time. The idea here is this. If you find a rock with horse bones in it and a rock with stegosaurus bones in it, you know that the rock with stegosaurus bones is older because stegosaurus didn't exist at the same time that horses did. Now, a lot of times what we find are marine organisms, things like snails and clams and fish and trilobites, which are kind of an extinct horseshoe crab. The idea is that, that we have certain assemblages of fossils or certain groups of fossils that only existed together at certain periods of time. Within these groups of fossils, we can find what are called index fossils. Index fossils are those creatures that existed for a very short period of time, but were found almost everywhere in the world. Uh, now these are very important because they tell us that if we find that fossil, that we know exactly when in time we're looking. So they become very, very important in figuring out where everything else is relative to that time. Now the second type of geologic time that we talk about is called absolute age dating. Now in relative age dating, we put things into a logical sequence of events, but in absolute age dating, we actually attach ages to those events. Now we do this through the magic of radioactivity. And it wasn't until the early 1900s that we knew anything about radioactivity. Back then, the Curies started investigating radioactive material, and that told us a lot about how these radioactive materials decay. Uh, now, when I talk about decay, it's not the same kind of decay as uh, roadkill on the side of the road. What happens with radioactive material is it turns from one atom into another. Now, what makes an atom an atom are the protons, the electrons, and the neutrons. In an isotope, we have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. So a proton tells us what sort of element we have. Lithium has three protons, helium has two protons, hydrogen has one proton. The number of neutrons tell us what isotope we have. An isotope can, be, can vary. We can have different numbers of neutrons. Now, some isotopes are what we call stable isotopes. They're okay with that number of neutrons that they have. Unstable isotopes, however, actually don't like the number of neutrons they have. They actually don't want to be that atom anymore. So, unstable isotopes will go through what we call radioactive decay. 
Now there are different types of radioactive decay and they all emit particles or gamma rays or things like that. We're actually not going to talk about that, but suffice to say that a parent is unstable and a daughter is stable. So a parent will turn into a daughter isotope. Now it takes time for a parent to decay into a daughter. We don't know when specific atoms will decay into their stable forms, but what we can measure is the ratio of how much parent we have to how much daughter material we have. And this decays at a very constant rate. And it takes a certain amount of time for a certain amount of parent isotope to decay into a daughter isotope. We measure the ratio of this daughter to parent, and the time it takes for the parent to decay by half is what we call its half-life. For example, carbon-14, an unstable radioactive isotope, has a half-life of about 5,700 years. So, after about 5,700 years, the total number of parent isotopes that were there has decreased by half. Think of it as a jar of red marbles. Those red marbles are going to turn into blue marbles spontaneously, and what we measure is the amount of blue marbles compared to the amount of red marbles left. So, when that happens, we measure a ratio of parent to daughter. We know that if, it, if half of the parent is left, we know that it's gone through one half-life. If only a quarter of the parent is left, we know it's, it's gone through two half-lives. Until eventually we have so little parent left that we actually can't measure that. That's what we call a usable half-life. And every element has a certain number of usable half-lives. Most of the time it's around five. But this means that beyond a certain time, we can't actually use that element anymore. For example, carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 years. We can't actually use it past about 50,000 years to measure the age of anything. So we have to move to another tool. Uh, in other cases, we use things like lead, or we use things like uranium. So how do we turn a half-life into an actual date of a rock? How do we determine how old something is based on its half-life? Well, the stopwatch of a rock begins when that rock cools. So an igneous rock that comes out to the surface of the earth cools down very quickly, and it locks in the minerals in that rock. They can't move around anymore. So at that point, we've locked in the number of radioactive parent atoms that are in that rock. Now, over time, these radioactive elements will decay, and we can measure the ratio of daughter atoms to parent atoms. And that tells us the age at which that rock cools. Now, if we take the radioactive age of a sedimentary rock, which is made from other bits and pieces of other rock, what we're finding is actually the age of the rock that that sedimentary rock is made from. So we can use this in various ways to help narrow down ages or find a specific date at which a rock formed. Those are the two ways that we study geologic time, relative age dating, and absolute age dating. In relative age dating, we put things into a logical sequence of events following five principles. Principle of superposition, original horizontality, inclusions, cross-cutting relationships, and faunal succession. In absolute age dating, we use radioactive materials to determine the length of time that it took for a certain amount of radioactive parent isotope to decay into stable daughter isotopes, and that gives us a specific date at which the rock that we found formed. So that's it for me. I think I'm going to go try and find some fossils in this quarry while I still have some daylight. And um, I think I just officially made myself the nerdiest tourist ever. But I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I'll see you next time.